Happy Saturday morning, everyone. My name is Manije Daneshpur. I'm part of the board, the family process. I have the pleasure of uh, introducing today morning's speaker, but before I do that, we had this amazing staff that have been catering to us since Tuesday because we had a board meeting and they have continued to support us throughout this conference. So can we give them a round of applause for all the wonderful work they have done? Thank you so much. Thank you all. Um, so I would like to introduce our today's speaker, a um, very accomplished um, giant of our field, um, Dr. Nadine Koslo. Um, she's a professor, vice chair for faculty development, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and the di director of the Atlanta Trauma Alliance at Emory University School of Medicine, Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences. Um, if I want to go through the list of her accomplishments, we will be here until tomorrow, and none of us want to do that. So, so sorry, Dr. Koslo, for not going through everything. But in 2020, she received the Emory School of Medicine Lifetime Leadership and Service Award for exemplifying the attributes of the ideal awardee given her commitment to service mentorship and leadership at Emory and elsewhere during her 30 years as a faculty member. I'm not going to say anything more, but the, in, the people in academia in this room, just be prepared that she has published more than 320 um, articles. So please help me welcome, and she has, just, you know, let's just take that for a few seconds. Um, and she has the slickest mask, everyone. Please help me welcome Dr. Koslow. Well, can you hear me okay? Well, good morning, and I'm probably the shortest giant you've ever met. <laughs> so I'm really happy to be here, and I'm really honored to be here as well. I want to talk a little bit today about culturally, respons culturally responsive and humble family therapy with the goal of advancing health equity. Since I'm your first in-person presenter, um, because I didn't know I had the option not to be in person, <laughs> um, I uh, need to learn to be more assertive and ask. Um, I thought we would have more of a dialogue, if that's okay with all of you. And so I'll kind of present part and then um, allow some time for reflection with each section and then sort of move us forward to make sure we, we cover everything. So just a little bit, I'm going to give a little bit of background and context about why this talk is even relevant and a little bit about why I'm giving this talk talk some about culturally responsive family therapy with African-American couples and families. This will be the bulk of the presentation, talk about sort of embracing a systemic and cultural lens, how to prioritize engagement, how to address systemic racism in the context of couple and family work, and then how to hold that dialectic with focusing also on family and community strengths talk just briefly about how to do this work with the specific goal of advancing health equity, and then some final remarks. So let me begin um, with a little bit of background about why I think this is so important. I wonder if I even have the right to give this talk, and I recognize that I'm giving this talk with many privileges I'm white, I'm cisgender female, I'm heterosexual, I'm upper middle class, I'm temporarily able-bodied. I was born and raised Jewish, but I'm now an atheist, which actually in this work is one of the most complicated uh, pieces of difference. And I'm actually a past president of the Family Process Institute Board of Directors. So I have tremendous privilege that I bring to this work. I do my best to be an ally, but I recognize 
that I will make errors today, that I will engage in microaggressions, and that I ask for your assistance in teaching me about those. A little bit more about why I'm here today. Actually, my first experience, I think, with doing this work was when I had the opportunity um, in, uh, in middle school, I guess it's called middle school now, it's called junior high school back then, to be the only white female to dance with Philodenko, an all African American black dance company in Philadelphia. For those of you, and I know there are people here from Philly or have been to Philly, um, this was a performance on the steps of the art museum. And it was really my first opportunity to be culturally embedded in what for me was a very different culture. And I really think that as a middle school kid, that experience probably set the stage for where I ended up professionally. As you already heard, I am a vice chair for DEI. But I also work at Grady Health System. And Grady is one of the largest public health systems in the country and actually in the world. 85% of our patients are African American or African descended. I direct the NIA project, which, and I've done so since the early 90s when I developed it. And it's a culturally responsive program for African Americans with a history of interpersonal trauma who have attempted suicide. I'm directing Caring Communities, which is a program for COVID-19 caregivers in the face of the pandemic. And so I've been very focused on the impact of the pandemic, particularly in the African descended community. Direct the Atlanta Behavioral Health Advocates, which is a social justice advocacy group. And maybe most importantly, isn't anything that's on my CV, but is what I hope to be my continued investment in, as, as Ken Hardy said, self-examination, self-interrogation, self-reflection, addressing my biases, listening, learning, and growing. And I invite all of you to help me in that process today, as hopefully I can help you just a little bit. We've actually at this conference heard quite a bit about part of the syndemic context, the COVID-19 pandemic, the, the really horrific impact on African Americans. And every day I go into the COVID ICUs and I witness up close and personal this devastating impact, not just on patients, but on their families. One of the, the, the actually the first time that I cried during the pandemic was when I saw a family outside the room of a loved one saying goodbye last March when they weren't allowed in the room. And it broke my heart. We know that discrimination in many forms has increased African Americans' risk for COVID-19. And we know that there have been poor, not only have we've heard about the poor outcomes including death. But these poor health outcomes then continue to cascade downward. So it's not just the effects of COVID-19, but it's the downward effects of that. There are lots of reasons that this has been true, unfortunately. And, and there's an intersection in some of this of race and class. Um, but that that's made for difficulties in physical distancing. And I really think it's so important as couples and family therapists for us not to use the word socially distance, but to use the word physically distance. Because no matter how physically distant we are, we need to maintain social connection. But there's also been the effects of being essential workers, essential workers who are rarely celebrated at least at the beginning of the pandemic, healthcare workers were celebrated. That's probably no longer true, but healthcare workers were celebrated for quite a while. Rarely have the essential workers, have our essential workers been celebrated. And certainly high rates of comorbid medical conditions that have increased people's risk, often due to lifestyle challenges. And that is very different than lifestyle choices, which we heard about yesterday as being very problematic. That, that are associated with racial and racialized stress and trauma. 
and of course, less access to resources in a timely, timely manner. So that's one part of the syndemic context. But we also know that the syndemic context has other parts. Another one being racial injustice, which has come to the foreground in the past year and a half, but which is not new. Many people have talked about these as double pandemics. Other people have said that's not a fair conceptualization, that this has been going on for so long that it is not a pandemic. But we know that African-American families have been marginalized for generations, not just for decades, but for generations. And that they've had ex exposure to disproportionately high rates of many, many, many bad things. Stress, disadvantage, poverty, and everything that comes with it. Interpersonal and intergenerational racial trauma and racially traumatic experiences and encounters. Unfair and brutal treatment by law enforcement structural and institutional racism, and morbidity and mortality. These racial disparities persist across wealth, health, education, and beyond. Another part of this, system, this uh, syndemic context is health inequity. That the high rates of stress that are associated with racial injustice have led African descended individuals, it's caused uh, sort of compounds, the emotional and behavioral problems that individual family members experience and that lead to conflict in families. There's often limited access to health care, including behavioral health care, and, and all of sort of the attendant challenges with that. There are cultural norms, difference, and dif uh, cultural norms, cultural differences with providers, and historic treatment inequality, and I would say current day treatment inequality as well, that result in service underutilization. I do have to say that I really believe that when we provide culturally responsive treatments, that this changes and services are not underutilized. So I really think that the challenge is for us as providers and as members of systems that offer services. And of course, and we've heard a lot about this here, and many people in this room have written brilliantly in Family Process and elsewhere about black lives mattering. And this is, this is really a reflection of the current call for racial equality and racial justice a call that has been present forever, but that must be heard now and responded to. Did you know that systemic racism was a public health problem? Well, finally, our country concluded that it was with the CDC's statement in 2021. And we know from the research from our practice that culturally responsive interventions make a big difference. They are associated with better therapeutic relationships, better engagement and adherence to care, a greater sense of being engaged in care, better outcomes, more satisfaction, and reductions in health disparities. And so it is in this context that it's critically important for us to talk about how do we optimize our interventions with African-American couples and families? And so as Ken encouraged us to do, I'd like to take a minute for people to share their reflections of what else is going on in our context right now that makes this so time sensitive and imperative. So I'll open it up to all of you to share your thoughts. Additional comments or things you see differently. Marianne. Yeah, thanks, Nadine. Um, this is a great framing, and all that you have said is happening and is true, and I think we realize it. I think 
layered on top of it, what makes it really difficult for me is a sense that truth doesn't matter anymore. That people live in their own cocoons of their own truths and there's not really a common ground where you can ascertain, well, what is the most believable part of this or not? So I think it's really hard to have true communication and conversations about these when people live in different realities, listen to different news sources, and don't agree on what is real anymore. And I've never lived through anything quite like that before. Yeah, that's, that's really a very good point and, and quite pertinent to this. I actually think we have lived through it. We've always lived through it, but I'm not sure we necessarily recognized how much we were living through it. Maybe it's living in the South, and I'm sure there are lots of Southerners here, but when I drive outside of Atlanta before this pandemic, before George Floyd, the second I drove outside the perimeter of Atlanta, I was exposed to a really different reality. When I worked with the legislature in Georgia for the first time to pass important, what I believe to be important legislation, and I refused to have my picture taken under the Georgia flag because I didn't want to have my picture taken under what was then the Georgia flag. I was really aware that three blocks from where I work, three blocks from where Martin Luther King got his health care, three blocks from where John Lewis got his health care, there was a Confederate symbol on the flag. And so I really feel like it's always been there. It's just in bold relief right now. But I also think that there are people who are never going to get this. But there's a whole bunch of people who are woke right now, who can move the needle, and if more and more of us move, things will be better. And that right now we have to try to do our best for people that are watching our same news stations and people who are believing this to move this needle. And then maybe or maybe not more people will come along, but we've got to, but, but we can't not do it because of the people who might not listen. But it is absolutely a really good point. I just wanted to um, say that it has always been with us Truth has always been a problem in this country. And I think that with social media, it's more in the face of people, but it has always been problematic. Also, it isn't just the South. You know, no. it, we have universities in major cities everywhere, and we still have sy systemic racism. And so I think that we need to understand that it's everywhere and that people become woke for a time, but then go back to sleep. Yeah. So uh, I just wanted to reinforce your comment that it has always been with us. Yes, so having grown up in the North, I absolutely, yes, absolutely point well taken, no question about that. Um, and, and I guess maybe in linking your comment to Marianne's comment, Maybe for those of us who are more woke right now, we got to keep us awake, you know, to try to keep moving this forward so we don't go to sleep. Yeah, everyone. I think for me, uh, one of the toughest part is um, living with privilege every day and survivor guilt. So many friends and relatives in Latin America, when we were celebrating access to vaccines and they just didn't know when they would have the option, people dying in the process. And currently right now, when you think about the options that you have and they don't, and you engage in those daily conversations, how, how do you communicate? How do you talk, meta-communicate about, you know, the life and death that is associated with those conversations? So I think also the, the, the privilege 
that we hold and how to move forward with that. Yeah, no, um, thank you for, for raising that and, and, um, and keep, you know, that was sort of my first slide and just keeping that in mind that, that our, my privilege, our privilege, everyone in this room's privilege, the fact that we can even be here, we all have a certain privilege. Um, but, but yes, how to, how to balance that and recognize um, all the people who don't have privilege. I, I um, um, relatively early on in the pandemic, WHO Africa invited me to give a talk to healthcare workers um, throughout Africa. And there were about 1,300 healthcare workers on the talk. And it was actually an interactive Zoom talk, which I like way better than sitting and talking to myself, which I hate doing. Um, and um, the first question was, doctor, how do we help um, our healthcare workers calm down enough to go into the hospital when we have, in capital letters, no PPE? And here we were bitching about having to change our N95s every few days instead of every day and not having the same yellow gowns that we had before the pandemic. We had now Home Depot gowns and they weren't as nice. Um, and, and I didn't have an answer. I simply didn't have an answer because the only way I've been able to manage my anxiety in the COVID ICUs is with all my PPE. And so you're absolutely right. Thanks for raising that. And that's not just in South America or in Africa. That's in our country too. One more comment and then we'll move on. Uh, thank you. I really appreciate your initial framing of all of this. And yet, as I was sitting here listening to you, I was struck by the number of people I know who would totally reject that framing, who hold a stance of, um, I mean, it feels like we're in two countries, and they hold a stance of uh, COVID's a myth, we have the best healthcare system in the world, and what's up with all this Black Lives Matter stuff? Systemic racism is just a liberal hoax, and I was wondering if you had any quick thoughts about trying to bridge that kind of divide. Do you want my personal answer or my professional answer? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, my, my professional answer is that we have remarkable skills and competencies as couple and family therapists to, to help people navigate huge gaps in values, huge differences in perspective. That's what we do every day in our offices. Helping people articulate their views, listen to the other, person views, other person's view or people's views, and find some common ground to move forward. I believe we're really, really, really good at that professionally. I'm not so good at it personally. And I'm probably not the only one in this room not so good at it personally. Who either wants to avoid those conversations or who as firmly as I believe in vaccination, nobody could change my mind about that. Nobody could change my mind. Somebody asked me if I had my third vaccine today and the answer is yes. Nobody could change my mind. And so I realize that I'm as, as stuck about this as, as other people on the other side. You know, I mentioned in my DEI vice chair role, I lead our diversity committee, and we have tremendous diversity on our committee, but we have failed miserably at having political diversity 
on our committee. And um, I had the incredible fortune to be on uh, Mayor Shirley Franklin's um, task force for, wi for women in Atlanta when she was the mayor. And it was the most diverse group I'd ever been on in any context. And I told my friends that I could not believe how diverse this task force was. And one day, Mayor Franklin walked in and said, I'm concerned about the lack of diversity on the task force. And I'm looking around the room thinking, what's with the lack of diversity? And she said, we don't have any Republicans here. We're not going to get anywhere without Republicans. And thus ensued a conversation in which we people talked about, not me, because I this is out, was outside my lane, different kinds of Republicans, and how we could not have token Republicans. We could not have a token Republican. And we could not just have what they referred to as a Rotary Club Republican, which is essentially somebody who's fiscally conservative and socially liberal. We needed to have, and they named our governor at the time, but it could be any one of our many governors, a, an X kind of Republican, which basically meant very conservative. And she said, we can't make change in this city unless we have everyone at the table. And so professionally, I believe, it's our responsibility to get everyone at the table, to hear every voice, and try to find our way forward. But I have to say, I'm getting an F in that right now. So let me talk a little bit about um, some notions about culturally responsive and humble family therapy. And I do want to acknowledge that it is the work of many people in this room, people who we heard from yesterday and other giants in our field that this, my thinking, is influenced by. Not surprisingly, given who the family I grew up in, the family of couple and family therapists and psychologists that I was raised in, I'm an integrationist and very much pull from multiple traditions in this work. I want to begin by sharing the end of Maya Angelou's Black Family Pledge. And sometime at the break, if you want to hear, I had the incredible opportunity to sit next to her on a flight from DC to Atlanta. And I was playing Scrabble on my laptop, and she thought that was pretty cool, and so we played Scrabble together. And I thought I was a good Scrabble player. And then I played with Maya Angela. She knew and saw words that I either didn't know or wasn't able to see. But her pledge ends as follows. Therefore, we pledge to bind ourselves to one another, to embrace our lowliest, to keep company with our loneliest, to educate our illiterate, to feed our starving, to clothe our rag ragged, to do all good things, knowing that we are more than keepers of our brothers and sisters. We are our brothers and sisters. So I want to talk a little bit, and we heard some about this yesterday, the importance, and I'm not going to give a lecture here about a systemic stance. Everybody here knows what a systemic stance is. I think that's this, one of the strength, one of many strengths of this group. But really appreciating the importance of us intervening multisystemically, understanding and intervening multisystemically, and extending that systemic lens to the racial and the socio political, which you just raised, context in which the family or couple is embedded. We also need to embrace a culturally responsive stance. Um, talk, which really has to do with the requisite knowledge, skills, and attitudes or the competencies to offer culturally sensitive and responsive interventions and to do so with humility. That requires us to be aware of our own biases as well as the biases within couple and family therapy. 
We also need to, um, some of you in this room talked about, cultivate our critical consciousness so that we really can understand and have a sensitivity to the social and political contradictions, many of which people in here have pointed out, and not just be aware of them, but take action against the oppressive elements that are illuminated by that understanding. We need to do this by using cultural models, such as the addressing model or the respectful model, so that we really identify, attend to, and respect diverse social identities and interactions among these. And this is really complicated when doing couple and family work. Because it's with us, if we're doing just individual work, the client and patient, obviously that's not relevant in, in more systemically oriented work. And each family member and the interactions among all parties. So if we look at all of the social identities overlapping and separate, when we see families, there's a lot to hold there and to attend to. But I think this kind of focus um, can really guide our conceptualization, treatment planning, and our interventions. I do want to say that I think these models are really helpful, and they're, they're listed here. I'm not going to go through them. But I have come to, excuse me, think of addressing plus or respectful plus because I think there are so many social identities left out of each of these models, one being, as you mentioned, politics. And I have to say, when I, the first time I was quoted in the newspaper about you know, dealing with navigating political differences within families and couples related to the, the election, the, the 2016 election, and how to handle that at Thanksgiving, I think, was what the newspaper article was about. I could have become a full-time practitioner within 24 hours if I responded to every couple or family who requested assistance in those 24 hours. I want to just point out in the respectful model, which I think is used less, actually, two things that I think are particularly pertinent to our work as couple and family therapists. That's the T for trauma and threats to well-being, and the F for family background and history, which are not on the list of what we often talk about as social identities, but which I think and believe are really critical to the work we're talking about. Shalonda Kelly and her colleagues talk about knowing how to, or when to apply cultural knowledge, ascertaining if the particular values, experiences, behaviors common to the community are pertinent to a particular couple or family. I think many people from my generation were trained, we read the book that said, X kind of families are this way, Y kind of families are like this, Z kind of families are like this, and we thought we were really culturally responsive if we read the chapter relevant to whatever type of couple or family we were. And it wasn't a universal model, but it was a universal model per culture. And I think what this really says is that's very simplistic and we need a much more nuanced perspective on that. Carmen, you and your colleagues have done a great job talking about equity-based practice that really appreciates the impact of social context and power on relationships. Talking about being attuned, naming, naming what is an unjust so that it can be more overt. Um, value, listening carefully and helping people articulate what previously was silenced, dismissed, marginalized, or as Ken said, masked. Interrupting, pointing out the power um, inequities when they're evident. Envisioning, helping couples and families contemplate and explore alternative ways to relate that are more equitable. And transforming them, engaging with them in a process of transformation in which we empower them to transform their interactions so they're more congruent with what they desire. We also need to incorporate salient cultural values. Um, this has actually been a really 
really bad week for me. I lost three friends this week, none to COVID. Um, and um, on Thursday, I did a debriefing, which I'm not really sure how I did for, for one um, of my African-American colleagues who came to work on Monday and died on Tuesday quite suddenly. And I, um, at the debriefing, was sharing a story about how um, when she and I both worked on the inpatient unit, the family believed that their loved one had the symptoms they had because of root work. This is a um, pretty common notion in the southern African-American community that roots are put on you and that that causes bad things to happen. And the solution or the way out of that is to have a root doctor come. And no antipsychotic is going to help and no psychotherapy is going to help and no family psychoeducation is going to help because if the cause of the problem is the roots, then you've got to do something about the roots. And I, I recall that this debriefing talking about recognizing that we needed a root doctor and I didn't have the first idea how to find a root doctor. It's not like you looked that up at that time in the yellow pages or now Google rootdoctor.com. Um, and I went, I went to this woman who was a, a um, bachelor's trained professional and said, hey, do you know a root doctor that can help us? And she said, I'll give you the name and get, get the person here, but you can never tell anybody I did that. And I never told anybody until Thursday, and that was over 25 years ago. We need to incorporate culturally salient values. Use culturally familiar terms, provide culturally tailored resources, and often use community-based locations. So reflections on a cultural and a systemic and cultural lens in doing this work. Comments or reflections, additions, changes. I see some of you taking pictures. If you want to email me, I'm happy to share my slides with you. Or I can give them to Lori, and she can just, that'll be easier. I'll give them to Lori. <laughs> let, me save my, let me save myself some work. Lori, would you mind doing that? Would you be willing to do that? OK, thank you. Hi, Nadine. I think it, I wonder what people think of this that in addition to being very attuned to the cultures that we are working in the subcultures, I think it's also important to remember that there are some basic similarities. We're all human beings. We're all children. Many of us are siblings, mothers. And those are the things that I clung to as an intern to connect with the population I was working with. Um, and and it worked. And I think if we, um, we need to know and, and honor the differences, also our own differences, but I think we have to keep in mind that basic um, connectivity is also possible at the same time. Yes, yes, wonderful point. Thank you very much. Betsy's been teaching me since I was my, in my freshman year of college, and she's still teaching me. Good point. Other reflections? I really loved the point that you said, that you also say you struggle with, is the need to have everybody at the table and how difficult that is. Um, I've been doing a, some work on uh, doing relationship education with churches and the range and how people view marriage in that uh, environment is really difficult to navigate. But I'll say we've had some really amazing conversations between people of different points on the spectrum that would never have happened if we hadn't gotten everybody at the table. But I'd say the person navigating it, it's been very hard. And it's actually made me feel, I'm a person of faith, but it's made me feel terrible often about religion because of the things that I see happen. So it's just, it's been a really difficult thing to navigate, but it's so important. But 
yeah, my personal and professional often are at war, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, but I think that does highlight that using our systemic and cultural lenses, we do bring a lot to the table to help people navigate, but we also need our own help in navigating. We also need our own help in navigating, yeah. But it is really powerful when we can do that. So in doing this work, we need to prioritize engagement. And I think we all know we need to begin with the self of the therapist. And we've already talked about examining, interrogating, and reflecting. I love that trio of, of ways of doing this. Being comfortable with our own racial identity and monitoring the emergence of racial transference and countertransference in the work. One of the things that makes me really sad these days is that in many training programs, virtually no attention is paid to building rapport and trust. I support culturally adapted and culturally relevant evidence-based interventions, but I don't think that any intervention works if it's not based on whatever we want to call it, the common factors, whatever, whatever words we want to, we want to use. And I, I worry, worry, it makes me sick that our training programs aren't prioritizing this the way I think they need to. Because no intervention is going to work if I don't have a relationship with the people that I'm working with. And that rapport and trust are critical to positive outcomes. That requires us to engage in continual self of the therapist work. It means we have to recognize and acknowledge power differentials. We can't get rid of power differentials. But there are things we can do to recognize them, not make them bigger than they need to be, uh, not dismiss the effects of them. Um, I think that when we're from a different racial background than couples and families that we're working with, building trust can be a very tenuous relationship, a, a tenuous process, and we cannot minimize how tenuous that can be. When I first started working with the African American churches in Atlanta, um, I went to work with a, one of the churches, and actually the, the head pastor is a psychologist. And at the end of the meeting, when we we're talking about sort of bringing this project to the church, he asked us all to pray, to hold hands and pray. And he prayed that this white doctor from Emory would not Tuskegee the members of their church community. And I didn't know until that day that Tuskegee was a verb. But I'm very aware where I, I'm very aware that Tuskegee is not just a place and a thing that happened, but it is a verb. And it is something I need to personally do whatever I can to not do. And not only that, to be an ally when that is going on and when maybe my BIPOC colleagues don't feel like they can step forward and say, this work is Tuskegee, our patients. So I need to appreciate everyone in the room who's white does, how our racial, white racial identity informs our worldview and impacts the lives of African Americans learn and strive to relate in ways that make others feel racially understood and comfortable. It means being culturally humble and responsive in the therapeutic relationship. More authenticity and mutuality than I think many of us were trained to do, to not share about the self of the therapist. That's it's not going to help me form a relationship. I've already talked about being mindful of power and privilege that people have talked about preventing 
the replication of the oppressor-oppressed dynamics. And this is really so key in this work. And when it does happen, we need to repair the associated ruptures. Just like we need to be attuned to repair and learn from other therapeutic ruptures that occur. When, the, when we do something that is microaggressive or that has a negative impact on the family. It doesn't matter what I intended to say. What matters is how it was perceived. I also think we need to expand our roles to embrace an anti-racist stance, to prioritize community-based approaches that move outside the office or the Zoom room or whatever, and to engage in socio-political action and social justice advocacy. We need to conceptualize the family as a vital support system. The notion of parentectomies, not a good idea. We need to foster each person's development of resiliency, including their trauma resiliency, and, um, and um, really see families as the vital support system that they are. This really involves partnerships as well. Who am I to help a single, low-income, African-descended mom with multiple kids engage in family therapy if she thinks I don't have a clue what her life is like and she's right. And so the notion um, of, that Creek and colleagues talk about of incorporating family advocates, fam parents or families who have previously sought services and who can help sort of serve as culture brokers. We don't use culture brokers very much in our country, but I think that they're critically important to helping families get help and navigate relevant systems. And you talked earlier, Christy, about the African American church community. I mentioned that as well. But they're really critical to helping families access more, more formal mental health services. Um, and so we really need to partner with our, our church leaders. Now, I recognize that in Atlanta, I partner with the concerned black clergy, and that is a subgroup of our church leaders. And this gets into this whole sort of larger issue. It's sort of like-minded church leaders. Um, but this is really important. In our assessments, to engage people, our assessments need to attend to the intersectionalities, assess culturally relevant constructs, employ culturally relevant assessments, African American genogram, cultural genograms, um, and the like. So reflections on prioritizing uh, engagement. Other thoughts, comments, what people do to foster, facilitate engagement. Carmen. Um, as you were talking, I was reminded of a study that one of my doctoral students did um, who was interested in studying how therapists engaged across differences. And he found that in um, our effort to be respectful of people's differences, we disengaged. We stepped back and we didn't bring ourselves into um, relationship and so I just thought that uh, sort of fitting with the theme even from yesterday of that even as therapists, we have to go toward, mm -hmm. feel comfortable enough to really want to get to know another person and not do it in like from this safe distance. But the fear was about not wanting to say something wrong or offending or, or something like that. And so I really, appreciated that study that he did. Louis Vargas. That's a really well taken point. That's, yeah. Yeah, and I bet it's so unconscious 
that we may not even recognize it. And, and I think that's where Betsy's point about connecting around similarities might be able to help us with some of that. Um, I really liked the term that you use, cultural brokers. Um, and it just kind of makes me think about like assessing myself, like I serve as a cultural broker and like the impact it can have on my personal life. Cause then you get this feedback of like, of course you believe in it, you practice that. You know, why wouldn't you? Of course you're gonna preach about it. So I just think, I'm sure there's other people in this room who kind of share that identity and how much strain it puts on your personal and professional relationships and then how you come across in the room. So I just really like that point. Well, and, and thank you for, for highlighting and underscoring the complexity of the role of cultural broker, a culture broker. Um, that well, it's a valuable role, it's not without its complexity. So I appreciate that added nuance, thanks. Hi, good morning. Good morning. I, I appreciate you um, underscoring the importance of engagement and connection. And to Carmen's point about uh, sort of bringing yourself to the situation, um, I'm sure I'm not alone in amongst uh, black therapists who have had people come to us, leaving another therapist, and you ask about the previous experience and this is what you hear. Well, they asked me a lot of questions, but they didn't tell me anything. So, and sometimes I went, you know, they'll say they went back a couple of times, but they felt like, well, they asked me a lot of questions, but they never really told me anything. And you realize it's not just that they're, the client is looking for something to be told to them, it's also that they just didn't feel like they had a connection to the person. And uh, culturally, so much turns on relationships for us, right? It's not just what you say, but how you make the person feel that you're, you're in it with them, right? That you're, you're really in it with them. So I just thank you for uh, underscoring this point and just wanted to add to Carmen's piece because maybe you don't get, look, none of us probably get the, uh, the full, uh, the feedback from the patients that leave us and go elsewhere, right? And we all have had that experience. So I just wanted to share that. Well, yeah, thanks, thanks a lot. It's a great reminder and it also brings to mind um, Sue and Sue's work on gift giving and the importance of the therapist giving a gift at the end of the first session. Um, and, and obviously that gift can be personal sharing, that gift can be empathy and validation, that gift can be um, a homework assignment. That There's lots of things that gift can be, but asking a lot of questions is not giving any gifts. Um, and, um, and, uh, you know, I, I, I have to say that um, I'm both dating myself and, and probably, well, sharing how culturally incompetent I was for a long time with this, but, um, you know, I was trained in a pretty, well, I had lots of different family therapy traditions I was trained in, but I certainly learned the importance of doing a genogram at the beginning. And I did that until I read some of the articles that I referenced, including one by Ken Hardy, um, that cautioned against doing a genogram at the beginning of the work. And, you know, sometimes you read an article, it's like eye-opening, like, I mean, I read that article a long, long time ago but it was eye-opening because it was something I did because I was trained that that's what you do at the beginning of every couples and family therapy. And then I read this article which basically was saying, oh, that's, you're not gonna get honest information. This is not helpful. This is not what to do. And so I think, you know, but what's a genogram? It's asking a lot of questions. And it's not engaging in a collaborative process of understanding a story. So thanks for that reminder.
Yeah, I just wanted to speak on um, the fact that, you know, when dealing with cultures um, and being this color, there's so many cultures and ethnicities within it. And um, I've found that we get stereotyped and clumped into one set of expectations or stereotypes of what this skin color represents, what the history of this skin color is, what our experiences are of this skin color. And yeah, some of the things do overlap, but some things are vastly different, you know, and being like a Nigerian American versus a African American, they may not even accept me as part of them. So, <laughs> and then you go on the outside and then white America clumps us all together. So you just have like identity confusion and no one really actually has like a, even a general idea of who you are, what you are. I'll just leave it at that. Mm -hmm. So I would say more education about the breakdown of cultures with black and brown skin, because there's so many different cultures and rituals and customs and religions and languages within that skin color. Yeah, th thanks for pointing that out. And I, I have to say, um, last night I went back and forth about the words I used in this in terms of black families versus African American families. And I went back and forth and changed it and then rechanged it and then changed it back and rechanged it. And finally decided to, um, to recognize that the, the majority of the work I do is with African American families and that that is what I know more, and that that was where I was more comfortable. But recognizing that in that choice of words, I was saying other things as well, and I appreciate you pointing that out. Oh, uh, hi, Celia. Hi, Nadine. Thank you so much for your great talk. I, I would like to uh, go back to the issue of trust, uh, because I think it is a fundamental issue we can't really work without that bridge, uh, and it's very difficult for white people to do it with persons of color. Uh, traditionally, like you, you said, there's lots of experiences of oppression that, that make people distrust systems, correctly so. So I just want to share for a minute what we uh, tend to do in some Latin American settings, settings you know, with immigrants. Uh, that maybe some are dependent on large community systems like churches, but others are not. But they live in neighborhoods for many, many years, and there are people who emerge in the neighborhoods who can be there for 25, 30 years, and they become something that we actually call promotoras in Spanish, which are you know people who understand their community and become absolutely the trust bridge. We can't really work without them because they introduce us to the patients, or to the clients. And they would say things like, oh, I leave you, in, this is Celia, I leave you in good hands with her. You know, I've known her for a long time and I, and I think you should talk to her. You know? And so uh, I, I think it is possible to develop that, those kinds of uh, triangular relationships that are very beneficial. And um, I, I think you, you also use something that I have never heard before, like cultural familiar terms. I think as outsiders, we tend to use things that are right in writings like traditional healing, folk healing. And we don't understand that that could also be a way of uh, not necessarily honoring people by using things like folk, you know, and, uh, but cultural familiar terms are precisely what people in the community are very familiar with, and they can teach us. So I, I do I believe that trust is the essential, you know, for all kinds of therapy, but in, in, in these situations, it requires a, light, a wider lens, you know. Mm -hmm. so. Thank you, can you repeat what the, word was for the person who serves in this capacity? Uh, promotoras, which is basically a trans, you know, the Spanish word is promotoras, but it should be, pro in English, it, the closest would be promoters. Okay, yeah. okay, great. Thank yeah. you yeah. very much. Um, and um, I, I guess the, the other thing that I 
want to highlight about what you said is, is sort of the different understanding of boundaries. Um, the different understanding of boundaries and, and how doing this work may entail different kinds of boundaries in multiple ways. That doesn't mean there aren't boundaries. They're just different than maybe the kind of boundaries we were, some of us might have been trained to hold. One final comment, and then we'll move on. Comment. Yeah, um, I also just, speaking about boundaries, wanted to say that um, I find myself, when I'm working with a family, to really think about what it is that they're most concerned about. And if what they're most concerned about is their family, which I work a lot with Latinx families, then I do the genogram at the beginning because the genogram is about the family and it honors not only who is in the family, but it also recognizes the traditions, the journeys, the changes in people's lives. But sometimes that can, it can take a different shape. Like if there are adolescents in the room, instead of doing a genogram, I do a timeline with a big roll of paper where the parents write their life, you know, different points of their life events, and then the adolescents do it on the other side of the paper, on the other edge of the paper, and then they can see the overlaps and do a lot of understanding. So it's, it's not like you should always do it or you should never do it, but just understand what they want, what they're needing mm -hmm. um, in the moment. Right. Yes, no, good point. And also that you might get different information over the course of time as you fill out the genogram. I like that timeline idea. That's really nice. So moving on, we've talked some about this here, but I, I want to talk more about um, this. In, in the work, addressing the impact of systemic racism, how to, to really, um, Velma Murray um, and her colleagues talk about in using a um, socio-historical, contextual, and lifespan understanding of stress and culturally specific stress-based coping adaptation. And what I like about this is it sort of links both parts that I'm going to talk about. And um, here's a, a sort of the model of, of that, um, her model for that. And I think you can see the various stressors and the pathways um, from historical to current to in, um, extreme environmental ones to uh, and f uh, family vulnerabilities and then the, w the ways in which cultural strengths play in and it's pot positive adaptation. Um, and so just thinking about the linking of stress and adaptation I think is really important. I think we, we, we've really um, highlighted here um, um, the importance of using critical race theory to understand African American stories of suffering, struggling, but also surviving, thriving, and flourishing. I think it's the whole sequence that's really important. William, thank you for nodding your head. <laughs> that makes me feel a little better. Um, that we need to raise, explore, and validate families' racial experiences guide them in navigating complex racial challenges, attend to various cultural stressors, and there's programs like the Protecting Strong African American Families program that I think does a nice job with this, highlighting to the families that the importance of addressing this is that doing that can improve the relationship communication. This gets back to what you're saying, Carmen. What is it that they want? Confidence, satisfaction, partner support, co-parenting, parenting. But we also, and I've really come to appreciate this doing the work I do, which um, primarily our patients, well, I said this at National Academy of Medicine meeting, I said that I, I worked with a low-income population, and somebody jumped up and said, I beg to differ, you don't work with a low-income population, and I'm like standing there like, uh -oh, what did I do wrong? And they said, you work with the no-income population. And that is probably a more accurate reflection of who I work with. And so entitlements, counseling, I hate that word, but um, about finances, health care, housing, and the like. With the NEO project, the most important thing I was able to do at the beginning of the pandemic was get money to pay for food for all of the people in our program. And I sent 
food weekly to anybody who needed it because people's food stamps were cut and people didn't have enough food to eat. And I am confident that the reason we had no one drop out of our program is not because of the wonderful virtual online groups we provided of March of 2020, because we didn't have a clue what we were doing, but it was because of the extra support that we provided to people to recognize what they really needed from us. Recognizing how cumulative racial stress negatively impacts couple and family relationships, emphasizing racial socialization and racial healing in the work. And I think there are different models for how to do this. I'm just going to mention the recast model, the racial encounter coping appraisal and socialization theory uh, by Stevenson. There's obviously other models. Um, but this approach recognizes that components of racial socialization can better prepare individuals to reduce racial stress and trauma and use engaged coping. And we talked about, um, in Velma Murray's work, the sort of the importance of, of adaptation. Um, used engaged coping strategies during racial encounters, which fosters racial healing. It aims to increase people's racial self and other awareness, their capacity to appraise and reappraise racial stress and to engage in r racial engagement and resolution skills or coping. The recast model has been integrated with other approaches um, to foster racial socialization and healing, and I think that it can be really very, very valuable to integrate this into our work. It's been integrated with trauma-focused CBT um, as well. And I, I want to mention the work of Anderson and colleagues in using the engaging, managing, and bonding through, brace, through, bonding through race or the embrace intervention, which is guided by this recast model. And it's a, an approach to, to family work with adolescents. Um, and it targets racial socialization practices between African American youth and the families with the goals of equipping these families with the tools to engage in bi-directional communications on race um, based on psychoeducation from the racial socialization literature, to manage racial stress and trauma through adaptive coping, to foster parent-child bonds through building communication and strengthening the relationship. We also need to prioritize psychological decolonization in couple and family therapy. I think we've talked a lot lately, and people have talked a lot about decolonization, but I don't think we've talked about it <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> enough. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm, I'm COVID negative. I was tested before I came. Um, we, we need to challenge family members' internalized racism empower them to develop agency, validate the family's construction of a different narrative. Yesterday in one of the groups I was in, people talked a lot about narrative work and, and creating new narratives, and encouraging the family to develop collective agency and engage in social action and advocacy, which are empowering. I think it's really important that we, to the extent possible, not advocate for the families and couples that we work with, but to advocate with the families and couples that we work with. If I'm advocating for people, then that is a very privileged stance of advocacy. There are times that that is what I need to do, and I have to recognize when those times are, but to the extent possible, doing that is actually disempowering of the very people I'm trying to empower. Can you, can you go can you go the mic? Please. Thank you. I know there's a lot of white people in the room. I mean, is it hard to know when to advocate, when not to advocate? Do you ever feel you're damned if you do, damned if you don't? Do you feel like there's always going to be some kind of a problem with how you did it? Do you feel like you're going to get picked apart? Is it stressful for you to understand how to try to advocate for you know, a marginalized population? Well, I'll start by answering 
all of those things are true. <laughs> uh, it, is, it is always a struggle. And yet for me to not do so is a bigger struggle. And so I can live with the struggle of doing it and maybe not doing it as well as I wish I could, maybe making mistakes in how I do it. But it's really hard for me to live with myself if I abdicate my responsibility and don't do it. And so it's about a value. And um, as, uh, as some of you know in here, I've been willing to, to go to the mat to advocate for social justice and human rights. Um, and I've been asked many times if I knew the outcome of my decision to go to the mat with the Department of Defense about human rights, would I do it again? And the answer is yes, because I can live with myself. So that's where I stand on this. Sorry about that. Um, good question. I think there's lots of ways that we can build critical consciousness to decolonize, do decolonizing work um, with films, vignettes, social media, cultural circles, um, empowering family members through being transparent, and that's part of what you were talking about, Marlene, I think is, is sort of more transparency, more authenticity, more honesty, and naming structures that reinforce social norms within the couple and family dismantling um, dominance and problematic power dynamics in, to support what's in the best interest of the family system. And so take a minute here for some reflections about sort of addressing structural racism in the context of couple and family work. There must be comments about this. Other things people do that are helpful, things I said that people think might not be helpful. Vicki? Hi, Nadine. This is fantastic. So my comment is, not necessarily specific to, to this topic, I mean, to your specific topic here. It's more about um, your whole presentation and I think everything we heard yesterday. And it's kind of an overlay that I've just been thinking about, which is something we're not really addressing, which is all of our therapy approaches, all of our models, all of our thinking come from whiteness. And if we don't know that, we're really doing an injustice to our work. So I just want us to be conscious of that. Right? Uh, yes, absolutely, which is why the first thing I said on the fl first slide was that. Because it is, it is, it is both my story, but uh, that's a reflection of our field. With, with some important changes, and I want to really recognize that too, with some important changes, important people in this room, important people not in this room, who, are, who have made some of that different. Marianne and then Fred. I just want to give a clinical vignette that touches on this back in the old days, which we've shared, but my first job was in, in Denver was at National Jewish Hospital, which was an inner city hospital treating uh, many children with respiratory disorders, primarily asthma. And not surprisingly, we had many African American kids with asthma who we treated there. And one of my first outpatients was a nine year old uh, African American girl who showed up alone, having taken a bus to the hospital for her first appointment. 
And I, as a white therapist, was like, what in the world is this? And so <laughs> I called her family, who ended up to be a grandmother who had a lot of physical health problems of her own, and she was the sole caregiver of this young girl, and explained to me that there was no way she was going to be able to get to my office on a bus to help understand what was going on with her. So we agreed that we would do a phone call as part of the session, and then I would see her granddaughter. And one of the uh, concerns the granddaughter brought to me was that the grandmother was beating her and nasty to her and locking her in her room and all these things. So I remember talking to the grandmother on the phone about, you know, what is this all about? She was like, I can't let her go in the streets. The streets are dangerous. There's no way I'm going to go in the street because I can't get down the stairs. And so she's mad at me because I keep her in the apartment. And, you know, from the white clinician perspective, I felt like, do I report this to child welfare and risk losing whatever alliance I have with the grandma and this girl? Or do I try to work with the grandma about other ways of doing this. And it was really an ethical turning point. I ended up not reporting it, actually. And we ended up working for several years. But for me, that was a good example of where the systems I had been taught just weren't going to work in that situation. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. <clears throat> Absolutely. And that's different than saying child maltreatment is OK. It's absolutely not saying that, but rather saying that in the, the context in which this family is embedded, what the value was, was to love and protect this child. And maybe there were some other ways to love and protect the child, but the grandma was doing the best she could in the context with the right values and goals. Fred. Nadine, thanks for a terrific talk and for a challenging talk. Um, I just wanted to add a reflection since you've asked for those, and I apologize to my fellow board members because they've heard me say this more than once as we've been working on this project, but it's words from 50, 60 years ago by Eldridge Cleaver. The time for neutrality is over. You're either going to be part of the solution or you're going to be part of the And, and I think people are here today because they want to be part of the solution. And I also recognize myself that in trying to be part of the solution at times, I'm also part of the problem. William. Nadine, thanks so much. This has been just such a wonderful presentation and so thoughtful and so deep. And so um, uh, there was just so much that was provided. And I couldn't help but think I wished when I was in graduate school that I had a professor or supervisor like you who uh, understood these kinds of things and the importance of it. I found myself, uh, and this was a long time ago, uh, you know, sort of alone in this. And I, and I recognize because of being a black person that uh, these were important issues, but whenever I would bring them to supervision with my uh, supervisors, uh, they were um, respectful of me, but they acknowledged they didn't know a thing about that. And I observe that even now in various uh, programs, uh, uh, training programs, except for maybe Marlene's program uh, in, uh, uh, at, at Drexel, most of the programs don't really deal with this kind of information in a, 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 a meaningful way, and I think students even now leave uh, uh, graduate training programs without having had uh, you know, exposure to the depth of this kind of information and the importance of it, or even feel validated in, in, in seeking that out. And so I wonder if you could um, uh, address that and, and speak to how we might um, uh, encourage or mandate, if you will, uh, training programs to really take this more seriously and, 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 and really in how they teach it. Because what often happens is that uh, 
they do the politically correct thing and say this is a really important value in our program, this is a very meaningful thing, and then we have this one course maybe in the program that uh, touches on these issues but doesn't really address it in a in, in a in a in a in depth way, and certainly not in the uh, supervision process. Well, I couldn't <clears throat> excuse me, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, and I, I guess I want to start by saying I, I think this needs to occur way before we go to graduate school. Um, I, when I reflect upon sort of my own story and why I'm doing the work I'm doing, um, my family has a lot to do with it. Um, I think many people in here know who my mom is and obviously had a huge, has had and continues to have a huge impact on me and given her work with international families. We, we had the opportunity to travel with her work and, and learn about families from other cultures. And, and there was tremendous role modeling in that. But the other part of that story is my dad, and who was not a family therapist. Um, what he, he called himself, uh, he was a financial planner, but he, he said he was a therapist for people's money. <laughs> he and my brother, it's occupation, as Steve Fleck said, is a sex-linked gene in the Caslow family. My father and brother are both financial planners. My mom and I both couple and family therapists. But I think that our parents, our family, teaches us so much about this. And I want to share one vignette that I think is the kind of value teaching that we need to learn way before we go to graduate school. We were um, in South Africa before the end of apartheid. My mom had given a talk on family therapy that day. And we were having dinner at the home of the head of the South African Stock Exchange. I was in graduate school at the time. My brother was in college. And we were at the dinner table, these very wealthy people with the servants standing around the table with their heads down. They asked um, at one point my mom what got talked about. And one of the things she talked about is she had raised the question about whether the servants were part of the family. And this very awkward <coughs> conversation then ins began. And my father stopped the conversation and said, I don't really know what to do. Excuse me, I don't really know what to do here. I know that when I'm in another culture, I'm supposed to be respectful of the values of that culture. But I'm not sure what to do when the values of that culture conflict with my own values. I feel like I need to live by my own values. And so I'm not comfortable with us having this conversation with people standing around who aren't allowed to speak, who aren't allowed to look at us, who aren't allowed to engage in the conversation. So I respectfully request that we either end the conversation we go to a private room later, or my preference would be we go to a space in your home in which everyone in this room can engage in a conversation. The adult children stood up to their parents for the first time and said, you know, when you would go out, we actually had, and they named for the first time the people standing around the table, sit in the family room together. We had lots of conversations in there. We just never told you. So maybe after dinner, we can all go there and have a conversation. I recognize there was still power and privilege. Certainly not everybody was equally able to speak. But in that vignette, my father modeled a lot for me. And so I think this needs to begin way before I go to graduate school but in the homes in which we're raised, in the schools in which we go. This notion of you have a course in diversity, or you get away from having the course and you say it's infused in the curriculum, 
so you don't even have a course. Like, those are our two options. I think it's a both and. But I, I, I think that part of the challenge is a lot of people, my generation, your generation, this is not the training that we received, and it gets perpetuated. I think there are lots of exceptions in this room. But quite frankly, I think it's all generations, because I think that often it's the people who will buy into the, the historically white power structure that become the educators. And I think the, that what gets valued needs, I think it's more than a course. I think it's about values. I think it's about, you know, I, I really appreciated that how you introduced me was about my service and leadership award. Because it is that that, that matters to me the most. It's not the however many publications there are. It's, it's the service that matters. And I think our academic institutions need to change so that what isn't valued is service, is engagement. Um, and, and I also think we need to keep writing. You know, one of the things I love about Family Process is the, the junior writers sort of program and then diverse writers and encouraging people from diverse backgrounds to write, to have opportunities with mentorship, to have vo more voices heard. And I think we need to do more writing, we need to do more speaking, and we need to, we need to be infused in these training programs. Because you can mandate all that you want, but I don't know if some of you have sat in some of these mandated courses. I'm not sure that's better than not having the course. Um, we need to have people on the faculty, um, everybody who integrates this work, not just the token person who teaches the course. I'm going to take one more comment and then move on. Sure. Um, speaking of being lonely in the field, as you were talking, um, I was an international student in a family therapy program and I was told that I it doesn't make sense for me um, to become a family therapist in, in the US because I don't know anything about this culture and I don't know anything about the people. But what's interesting was that, um, I mean American people, um, but uh, by that they meant white people. Um, but what, what, what was interesting from the beginning of my training was that I knew more about systemic racism I knew more about what has happened to indigenous people. I knew more about what has been happening with wars and destructions of you know, colonialism and in other countries and the impact of that in, in, in people here. And so I decided, I got permission to just take the family therapy courses and find my own internship and went through this process and finally graduated um, with a degree in, in family therapy. And um, I uh, have had a, uh, still do a Middle Eastern accent, worked in a, a completely white um, clinic that was an APA accredited and the only reason they accepted me was that I said I don't mind going to people's homes, clueless about what that meant and the connotations behind it. But what, what was important was that the um, Bill Doherty in his Moral Responsibility uh, book says uh, there, is, there are virtues for different groups of professionals and for family therapists the, one of the virtues is courage. And so I have made way more mistakes working with Middle Eastern families as opposed to working with white mainstream families. All these years, I have been corrected way more in those contexts. So people think just because you are from a context other than the white context, you don't make mistakes. I think the difference is having the courage to um, engage in those conversations, make mistakes one after another, and still engage and say, correct me if I'm wrong, and then ask another question and, and just humbly sit there and engage in that conversation. So I really appreciate you bringing this and having us reflect as we are continuing this conversation. And thank you for your courage and for taking that course too. <laughs> we're, we're fortunate. So the, the other part that got mentioned yesterday was has to do with capitalizing on strengths, paying attention to family strengths, and again, I don't want to, 
you know, it's always hard when you make a list of strengths and then generalizing and it's not true for everybody. And I, I, this is with recognition of the downside of that, but also with recognition of the importance. Just like you said, it's not the same, not everybody deals with the same structural racism, not every family or community has the same strengths, but these are ones that have been found pretty repeatedly in multiple studies and multiple clinical writings, flexibility and adaptability in roles, extended kinship networks and strong intergenerational ties, sense of reciprocity, oneness, caregiving emphasis, what I really thought was interesting is some of the research on internally consistent family structures. So family structures might be different, but the internal consistency of them. The prominent role of spirituality and of religious institutions, strong work and achievement orientations, high levels of resilience marked by optimism, hope, resourcefulness, and a sense of collective socialization. Fa families often have strengths in in nurturing and protecting their children from racial dehumanization, teaching them survival strategies for overcoming messages of black inferiority, offering them emotional support in coping with racism and racial discrimination, and providing tools and resources for overcoming structural barriers. This process of racial socialization in families is something I think I would say as a white therapist, I was much slower to get because that list I showed before was the list I read a lot more. Um, and I think really focusing on the importance of the strengths related to racial socialization um, is important. There's been talk at this conference and Evan talked about it and, and others have talked in small groups about using stories and storytelling and people have been doing that today that that's an important, an important part of this work. Um, introducing notions of strength to families and listening and being curious about their perspectives on their strengths. Capitalizing on these racial socialization practices I just noticed, uh, noted in the positive black identity, black pride, sort of cultural resilience. Bolster what Linda Burton talks about is the family home place which are individual and family processes that are anchored in a physical space and that face elicits um, empowerment, uh, rootedness, ownership, safety, foster social and cultural identity. Resolving presenting problems, which, which you mentioned earlier, Carmen, about improving problem solving, increasing a sense of dignity, self-worth, validation, and often using spirituality to shape outcomes. I think we need to be conceptually and evidence informed in doing this work and there are different models that, that um, people have put forward that may be helpful. Just some examples of the Afrocentric intergenerational uh, sodality model, the family empowerment team, models like this can be really, really helpful. The, we need to bolster protective processes in families because they're associated with better outcomes in family members. And we need to be really focused on the fact that there's quite a bit of evidence that, foc that uh, capitalizing on addressing, building upon strengths, um, influences outcomes in terms of the acceptance of therapy process, improving parenting skills, en enhancing communication, and increasing confidence in family members. I'm gonna move on um, a little bit and we can reflect at the end here. Um, culturally responsive family intervention. So let me just move beyond sort of just thinking in the therapy room and, or in the ho home or in the community, but really with a focus on health equity. And I just wanna make a few, a few comments here. In doing this, I think we really need to employ culturally sensitive or responsive health care. And, and I think no time has this been more evident than during the pandemic. Considering the cultural meaning of health and illness for the family, the role of culture in wellness protection, family members' experiences of racism, of discrimination and marginalization, and how these experiences have impacted their life opportunities, quality of life, health, and access to care. And we not only need to be attuned to this, but we must tailor our services accordingly. More and more has been written about 
shared about the importance of being mindful of and addressing explicitly the social determinants of health. Um, culturally, uh, culturally sensitive health care also means employing a respectful, empowerment-oriented, and trauma-informed practices. And that this needs to not just look at sort of interpersonal trauma, but also the traumatic effects of systemic inequities and structural racism on the couple and family. So I think when we talk about trauma-informed care, we need to have a broad lens on what that is. And there are evidence-informed strategies to address healthcare disparities and it's imperative that we implement these. I think a patient and family-centered model, particularly for, for health-related care, um, is, is um, really cru crucial for us to embrace. It's associated with increased comfort and trust, better adherence, outcomes, and reductions in, 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 in inequities. One of the things we spent a lot of time doing during the pandemic is creating a roadmap for culturally informed um, patient and family-centered health care in the hospital setting when the signs all say no visitors allowed. And how we, um, my belief is that many people died not because their lungs gave out, but because family was not at the bedside. And it's really hard to hold on to life when you're all alone in the room and everybody else is masked and gowned and has face shields on. That the, the partnership between the healthcare team, the patient, and the family needs to be a true collaboration. We need attitudes, behaviors, but also policies and a physical environment in, the, in our healthcare systems that patients and families view as respectful, allowing them to bring in things that reflect the patient, reflect their culture, and empower them in a meaningful way to engage fully in decision making and then respecting their values and preferences. You just brought up the issue of training, and I think we need to advance health equity through our training so that we train people to provide high-quality services, but ones that are accessible, affordable, and acceptable. That we, ad we train people to adapt culturally services for each family, develop collaborative relationships, attend to place or home place, which is so important I've already mentioned, educating interprofessional colleagues about the values and preferences of diverse families, emphasizing and valuing a culturally diverse healthcare team. Our healthcare team should look like the people we're working with. Leveraging technology to do this, and we've learned much more how to do that, and monitoring family outcomes and satisfaction with culturally relevant methods, which I don't think we do a good job of at all. There was an article that came out yesterday in STAT, um, and it's called Health Equity Tourist, How White Scholars Are Colonizing Research on Health Disparities. It's a really, it was a timely article that came out yesterday. And we really need to turn a tide of white researchers, and this was mentioned yesterday, um, I believe Evan mentioned it, building on the work of BIPOC scholars without, cut, without citing them or including them on grants and publications. But we need to call attention to and redress the bias in much of the health disparities research that's being conducted. Ensure that this work pays attention to racism in the social determinants of health and engage in difficult and direct, and I would add your word, courageous discussions. Thank you for the addition of that word. And so, in the service of time, hopefully, we must continue to engage actively in conversations such as the ones we've been having at this conference so that we advance our confidence in offering couple and family interventions that foster resilience and empower African American families to thrive ensure culturally responsive patient and family-centered health care that is accessible 
to African American families in integrated care settings. It is imperative that we reduce health disparities and promote health equity for African American families who are seeking services. In addition, for ourselves, we need to recognize and eradicate the microaggressions and racism with racism within our field. Engage actively and fully, all of us, in anti-racist work and dismantle structural racism that exists within our professions. I believe that each of us, everyone here, all of our students, our colleagues, and the couples and families with whom we work need to commit to social action and social justice advocacy that is aimed at the elimination of structural racism and building a more equitable and inclusive culture. We have to cr form cross-sector collaborations to advocate for policies that address social determinants of health, things like housing, employment, access to healthy food, not food deserts. Speak out against racial injustice and fight for racial justice. Be leaders in efforts to dismantle white supremacy and build trust through systemic and intentional strategies and restorative justice. And demonstrate consistently that we value black lives. And I'm going to have you, you I'm, as I started, I said that my first training in this work was with Philodanko. And I'm going to end as we take final comments and reflections with Alvin Alley performing Rocking My Soul in the Bosom of Abraham. Thank you very much. And we can take some questions. We can take some questions and comments while we watch this. So I'll take some questions or final reflections. I have to say, Judith Jameson was from Philadelphia, and I first got to see her when I was in elementary school, and I'm now the psychologist for the Alvin Alley Company. So, so any final comments or reflections? Jay? You, you can turn them, you can turn it down. I, I'm just curious, Nadine, you, you are probably in the best position of anybody in the world um, because you, uh, to speak to the question I'm about to raise, which because you, you really uh, deal with mental health settings, uh, you know, throughout, at least throughout the United States and probably the whole world. Okay, so there are settings like yours that are a model of working in the ways you talked about. Yes, uh, there are community settings that are models in the same way. Uh, there also is this thing that I refer to as the industrialization of the mental health field. Yes, uh, with a, uh, which, which uh, provides a set of rules and regulations for what people are supposed to do. And uh, they may put a couple things in there about uh, diversity or whatever, but the, that, that, you know, that, that's not, this is not where the soul of that is, yes? So I'm just, I'm just curious from your experience, how, how do you see people who, who work in those contexts, lots of providers now work in those contexts, yes? Um, how do you see them working with these, uh, these issues? So, you know, yes, there are ways in which the context in which I'm embedded supports this work, but we don't have ECMO at my hospital. And ECMO's been critical to saving people's lives during this pandemic. We have ECMO at Emory for the people with money. We don't have ECMO at Grady. So there are disparities everywhere. And 
When I got there, I was told, quote, families aren't going to come here for family therapy. You're not going to be able to do family therapy here. It's not like this existed when I got there. I think we need to build this one step at a time. I've been teaching a live supervision family therapy seminar, first at Yale and now at Emory, because of the seminars that Marianne and Fred and I were in with Carl Whitaker and David Keith and Al German and David Rice. I started doing that in 1984. Average attendance for the seminar is 75 to 80%. Pandemic hit, I stopped the seminar, couldn't figure out how to do couple live supervision, couple and family therapy. Took a few months, we figured out the technology for doing it. We had, had, we had 100% attendance when we moved back virtually. 100% attendance in a live supervision couple at family therapy seminar. I've been doing that since 1984. We never even got, if we ever got above 80%, it was amazing. And I think we need to take the good from this pandemic and learn from it. Why did we have that? Because it was accessible. Nobody had to pay money to go on MARTA and wait, and then it rains, and then, you know, whatever the story is, and it is, and it is, and they could be all over, and they could do whatever. And I think, for me, it's a good message of, well, we always did it this other way. And it didn't work so well, but we never changed it. We just kept doing the same thing. And I look at how many other things we do that aren't so good, that we just need to do it differently, and we can do it better. And so I think in those organizations, they're not going to change the culture overnight. But you have one person, and they take one step, and they get another person, and then two of them do it, and then three of, excuse me, three people do it. And I think that's how our ancestors built this field. And that's what we need to keep doing, to keep growing and to keep going into our communities. Thank you very much for your comments and your reflections.